Welcome to Los Olivos Wine Merchant Cafe, where you not only get to taste uh, California Central Coast wines and California Central Coast food, but you also get to meet the winemaker. And today we have with us Jim Clendenin from Au Bon Clement. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Great to be here, Sam. Nice to see you. And I noticed that uh, something new about you today. You actually uh, cut your hair, which was a little different than what I'm used to seeing you. <laughs> you know, I just, just had my 35th anniversary party. We had a sit-down dinner for 50 people and uh, I thought I'd scrub myself up a little bit for it. So I had a kind of a scruffy gray beard and, and I had more hair and now I have less hair, less hair and I have a little bit of a goatee and that's it. It looks very good. Thank you. So uh, if you can sum up um, your winemaking style or what you try to infuse into the wines in one word, what would it be? You know, tradi traditional styling, very traditional styling. Uh, I don't believe that it's fair to compete if you change the rules in a game, no matter what the game is. And, and I think that wine has historically had a place at table. I think it's historically been a crisper, more acidic, brighter kind of thing as, as uh, uh, the difficulties of growing grapes in Europe have, uh, has often resulted in. And I think that in California when people started celebrating sunshine and heaviness and alcohol and flatness and lack of food compatibility, they lost something in the translation of what wine should be. Um, I get into arguments about this all the time. There are people that believe in California, we have sun, we should celebrate that sun. And I always believe if you pick the easiest path, it's rarely the most successful path. Well, uh, your wines, uh, like you were just saying, how well they go with food, and that's so true because we had a dinner just, uh, was it about a year ago, we had a winemaker yeah. dinner here where you and Bon Linquist were here and we had some of your wines here. And, and they were fantastic. They went really well with food. So it, it was a beautiful job on them. But what was incredible also was that these wines, because of your style, they last a long time. You can, you brought in a bottle of Chardonnay or something that was, was it 15 or 20 years old? And yeah. we opened that up and it was, it was just delicious. So it's really fun to be uh, working with a Bon Climat this time instead of Clendenin family quite as much because uh, though I love the Clendenin family wines and they're actually my first label, not my second label because I grow the grapes. I planted the vineyards so you can kind of see where, uh, where my heart is now compared to when I started this company back in 1982 with Adam Tolmack, who was a partner of mine until uh, 1990. We were working with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because uh, that's what we like to drink, that's what we like to experiment with, that's what we like to work with. Uh, Adam and I had worked at Zaca Mesa in uh, the uh, 78, 79, 80 period, and I went down to Australia, and then I ended up in Burgundy, where Adam joined me in 1981 and uh, and worked the harvest in Burgundy. And once I got there, I cemented all my feelings for traditional wine styles. So moderate alcohol, really, really bright acidity, great longevity in the bottle, and um, and we, we've hopefully uh, improved on, on that style and the quality of that style over the last uh, 35 years. Yeah, definitely, and and you were one of the, as you said, one of the pioneers of Santa Barbara County <coughs> wines and, and one of the earliest winemakers here, and I guess you got your start in Zaca Mesa in the early years, and then how did you evolve from working in Zaca Mesa and then you traveled a little bit to starting Au Bon Clement and I know you wanted to do uh, wine in kind of French style but how did that whole thing happen from Zaca Mesa to having your uh, production facility uh, where it is now near Bien Nacido, where you can get some grapefruit from that vineyard and so forth. Absolutely. You know I'm, I'm, uh, I've been asked that question sort of non-stop for the last 30 years and I can answer the question in three minutes, one minute, 30 seconds and I'm going to try to give a little bit of an elaboration because it was a very 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 special period of time. Bob Lindquist, Adam Tolmack, Ken Brown, myself, Matt Bootman, he washed out of boot camp so he couldn't stay with us because he just didn't have the go. But all of us were totally in love with wine and most of it at that period of time was French wine. So we drank a lot of it, we had incredible tastings, we had competitions, comparatives, verticals, horizontals, and that was our life. None of us had uh, wives in, in that period of time, and uh, we loved wine, no question about it. And so not just working at Zaca Mesa, but working at a very special time with very special people at Zaca Mesa was a huge grounding for me in what I was doing. And then the same thing when I went to France. And people that are the, the watchwords in Burgundian winemaking now, Cocherie, just started making wine in uh, uh, Pouligny-Montrachet in, in Merceau. 
Dominique Lafon. I actually beat Dominique by three years to making wine, and now when you talk about it, he's like my great grandfather. People say you learned a lot from Dominique, didn't you? And I go, no, I didn't learn a lot from him, but we learned a lot together as we were kind of evolving. Because during that period of time, in the late '70s and early '80s, the notion of a state-grown Burgundy instead of negociant Burgundy was just first beginning to imprint itself on the American wine consumer and for the European wine consumer, for that matter. So that specific period of time from, say, 1978 until 1985, I believe more quality decision-making was developed for making fine Chardonnay and Pinot Noir than any time in the world's history. Amazing, huh? Yeah, no kidding. Fantastic. And you're also a gourmet uh, gourmet cook. I've, uh, you have dinners every once in a while at the winery and so forth and invite some people over and you and you bring out your wines and so forth and uh, do you do quite a bit of that the matching the, the food with the wine and so forth to see which which wine goes best with what you're cooking do you do you start with the wine or do you start with the food and then, then bring the wine in I start with the wine you start and with the wine you have to start with the wine if you're a winemaker we don't do dinners Sam uh, out at the winery as, as much as um, you know, I do dinners for charity, and I often do them at my ranch, but the majority of what my cooking is is uh, buffet lunch. Exactly. And That's what yeah, it was. It was yeah, a buffet lunch. It wasn't yeah. a dinner. It was a buffet lunch. And right. I do that every day when I'm at the winery. I'm, yeah. I'm going to do it today. Fantastic. So you cook for the staff uh, at lunchtime and so every, forth? Every day. So the staff, guests, uh, uh, we, we sell a lot of it for charity. Right. And so we've got a couple of charities here in, in Los Libos now, the, the St. Mark's uh, wine event that they do and, right. and uh, the Central Coast Wine Classic. And we'll, we'll give a chance for four or six people to come to the winery and have lunch. And then I go into the library. I've got a very extensive library because I'm a hoarder. And uh, I don't have newspapers and I don't have cats, but I have too many boxes of wine. <laughs> no question. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that was. A, I remember that that lunch was a wonderful event. Not only were the wines great, but but the food. I was very impressed with your uh, cooking abilities. The food was very good as well. Um, so, um, where do you see Santa Barbara going? Do you, do you see keeping on the track, Santa Barbara County wines of you know your your main core wines, basically Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and then you branch off from that. Is is that correct? Is there any like new wines or new directions that you see Santa Barbara County going in? Well, you know, uh, there, there aren't a whole lot of practitioners now, but there's a couple, uh, certainly Steve Clifton and myself, making Nebbiolo. And Nebbiolo is a tough thing to make, but we are now selling Nebbiolo out faster than our Burgundian varieties, which is wow. amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. And, of course, Syrah has uh, always been great from here. Cool Climate Syrah has been fantastic. My partner, Bob Lindquist of Coupe, just makes spicy sort of green pepper, black pepper, white pepper, Syrah, that is as interesting as anything that's coming out of the Rhone Valley, there's no question about wow. it. And and unfortunately, for whatever reason, the mixed flavors of Syrah, like Zinfandel, uh, the mixed flavors killed Zin back in the, in the 70s and 80s. Now you've got jammy, really, really, really heavy, sort of sweet Paso styles of Syrah that the critics love. And then you've got real styles of Syrah that are cool climate and and Rhone Valley style, and the critics are kind of on the on the fence about them, and I and I don't know why, but I think that ought to be. We always said that after Merlot, the next greatest category was going to be Syrah. Easy to say, two syllables. Instead, it became Pinot Noir. Who saw that coming? I don't know. Maybe only Alexander Payne from uh, Sideways. Exactly. A movie comes out, and uh, Pinot Noir is the rage, you know, and Merlot takes a dive. You know, right? Yeah. Strange, strange things happen that you don't expect. Yeah, for sure. That shows, shows shows how fragile our culture for wine is in America. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And uh, and like you were saying a little bit earlier, now rosé is the rage, right? Everybody can't yep. get enough of rosé. It's like all of a sudden it, it's picked up. I know I've, we've been here about 22 years, and rosé has been always there, but nothing really big as it is right now. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and uh, you know, people said that about Riesling for a while, and then um, Riesling didn't come to fruition with quite the... Uh, uh, heavy hitting power of rosé now. It's unbelievable and of course it's perfectly popular in January. It's wonderful yeah. on the Thanksgiving table. It's yeah. sensational at Christmas time and so people have found a way to extend the drinking season. I mean I think in uh, uh, in the south of France right, much much before June 1st nobody's drinking rosé and then between June 1st and September 1st that's all they're drinking and uh, I think for us we've extended it and found ways to make rosé uh, complete the uh, the meal uh, all the time all year long 
Yeah, absolutely. I was actually having a, a glass of my Nebbiolo rosé last night, which was pretty good. There you go. Now, nice. now, you're, now you're summing up all the possibilities of my prognosticating. Yeah, lots of possibilities, absolutely. Well, great. Uh, it's great having you here and talking to you. And I know that we're going to be featuring these uh, Aubon Clement wines uh, through the month of August. Um, and they're going to be 20% uh, off. Um, right here at the Los Olivos Wine Merchant Cafe. And then um, I know at the end of the month, we're gonna be having uh, a pouring of these wines as well. So uh, come on down and uh, have some Obon Clement wines, get a good price on them, and, and try these beautiful wines that Jim has put together. Thank you, Sam.